I'm a feminist, but I've told everyone I've met today, from barista to pilot, I'm very hungover and expected them to look after me. <laughs> Do you know what? They pretty much all did. I flew from Ireland and people were like, oh, oh it's awful, isn't it? I went, yes, thank you. <laughs> Can I have a banana, please? I'm a feminist, but the other day I looked at an article that I'd seen on Twitter being mocked by a feminist just to see how awful it was called How to Get a Happy Summer Vagina <laughs> in Teen Vogue. And actually, I found it very helpful. <laughs> it wasn't as risible as you'd think. No, I sort of thought, oh my health. God. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I it love was. Teen Vogue. And do you know... You know when your mother would say, get out of that wet bathing suit because you shouldn't be running around? She was right. You thought she was being a boring fun killer? No, no, no. She was being a fungus killer. That is correct. No, you mustn't stay in your wet bathing suit because it can have serious lifelong ramifications. Also, beware of sunburn on the vagina. <laughs> and doing handstands while sunbathing, clearly. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Beware of that. I'm a feminist, but... I'm so keen for approval that uh, when I took a urine sample into my doctor last week, I said, is that an OK colour? Even though it was obviously a fabulous colour. <laughs> it was practically Evian. <laughs> and I thought, if you're not going to pay me a compliment, I'm going to make one happen. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but... My mother once told me that when she was a young woman going to a very glamorous old Australian cinema on dates, at the end of a sad film, they would lift the lights only a little bit so that the ladies had time to adjust their makeup in the dim and so that when the lights were fully up, they looked completely collected and demure and suitable for their date. And a little piece of me wants that back. <laughs> little piece of me does yeah. I just love the idea I love the idea it's so civilised isn't it I mean it's so it's so glorious that you get just a little moment and also in this fantasy I have a sort of silver compact I'm not rooting around in the bottom of a bag that has sort of chocolate wrappers and brisket crumbs and, and half a lipstick that's fallen off no no I have my mother had a velvet clutch when I was a little girl that she used to take out with mother of pearl little handle on it and she'd she sounds like up. an absolute fucking lady your mother I mean I wouldn't describe her as an absolute fucking lady to her face, but she is. Um, she wouldn't like that at all. Um, she'd have to adjust her makeup quite a lot after that. Um, Dim the lights. This is the time when women wanted to look like grown-ups. And now the only question is, how long can I sustain the look of a 14-year-old? <laughs> Why don't we want to be out in a sort of black velvet gown with a long cigarette holder? A bit ready for my close-up, like in the montage. Yeah. Oh, if yeah. you've joined the podcast, if you're listening at home... There's a montage. If you just pause this now and you go to the show notes, there's a YouTube link. Watch that, because that's important context. Was Tallulah Bankhead in that montage? Tom? No, she wasn't. no okay. Thought no. I saw her, but was just being... Gotcha. Glorious gotcha. Gotcha. I love yes. Tallulah Bankhead, though. She is... In fact, I wrote a book called The Guilty Feminist, which is coming out in September. Um, please order it now from Waterstones. <laughs> there's a whole section, because I have different... Um, my favourite Guilty Feminists from history in it throughout it. And my favourite ever is, is no Tallulah way. Bankhead, yes, who you played I in a played film. I played in a film, yes. And I never really nailed the accent or the confidence. I'll be Why honest. Why are you saying that? There's well, well, I was going up, the, I've got to go sweep up the stairs. It's in Florence Foster Jenkins. And I've got to sweep up the stairs, all sexy and all like. And there was a lady behind me who at one point said, um, you've got to make an ooh with your mouth as if you're sucking a cock. And it really threw me. <laughs> Uh, I understand. I was gone for the rest of the day. I understand It would why. be such a thin little cock. <laughs> it, like a little Ooh. spaghetti willy. I mean, <laughs> Tillaloo Bankhead wouldn't, wouldn't be messing about with that. No, 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 no. I'm a feminist, but I sit very quietly, even though I'm bored, and I let men talk about sport because I think it's somehow good for them in terms of, like, communicating and expressing themselves and, like... <laughs> And I always thought it was a really nice thing to do. And it was only today I found myself doing it to my partner and father-in-law. And I thought, they're not monkeys. Like, they're fine. They are absolutely fine expressing their feelings. One of them cries at adverts all the time. 
you can guess which one. And I just, I don't know where I got that idea in my head that like, let them have a little, it's good for them. It's good. It's good for them to have an outlet for their emotions. Yeah, that's what I think. I'm a feminist, but I don't walk around naked when I'm on my own because my brain turns into a critical aunt I call Clara. <laughs> it just goes, hmm. She doesn't really say much. It's just the face she makes. <laughs> it's an eyebrow raise. It's like, could be... Could be different, couldn't it? <laughs> Does Clara disapprove of you walking around naked like you think you're someone? I think it's more that she spots what she perceives as flaws. They're not flaws. They're, They're not my flaws. amazing body. Yeah. But I distance myself from Clara the same way I would distance myself from an actual critical aunt. But it's still annoying if they're in the room and you just want to shut it up. So mm. if I put my clothes on, she goes away. <laughs> mm. I write books for teenagers and I gave a school talk at the Royal School of Ballet and they were lovely but I was saying to them like whenever you think about being mean to yourself think would I say that to a friend I would mm. never be as mean to a friend as I am to myself and they were like that is so true and I left them and I was all inspiring and I sat on the train and I saw myself in the mirror and I was like fuck me I look awful <laughs> Live from the BMI in London, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Nat Nassima, and very special guest Yasmin Akram, talking about dangerous women on screen. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. Have you had a good week, Nat? I've had a brilliant week, thank you, Deb. Yes. Have you had a guilty week or a feminist week? You know, actually, quite a guilty week, if I'm honest, I think. I had, um, we love it when you're honest. I had a bit of good news. Like, I was long-listed for a short story award. Like, Ooh. I mean, it's niche, but I care. And I honestly, like, redrafted my tweet saying it three times in case it sounded arrogant and I attracted the ire of someone who swept in and was like, um, get a grip on yourself. Yeah. The way that you have to operate, I think, in terms of being proud of your achievements is such a minefield for a woman because at the heart, society wants women to be demure and understated. And so there's a little bit of us that goes, if I say this like a bloke would go honoured to be nominated or something I chuffed. say surprised every time. How bloody surprised can I be? I wrote it. I entered the competition. <laughs> I mean, oh my God, how did this happen? You made it happen. So that's yeah. how that's you, you asked for it specifically. Yeah. You wrote in, dear people who give awards, give me one. I would like this one. And then they did. Then you went, I can't even think how this has happened. <laughs> this is crazy town. Uh... What? Me? Me? Me. I mean, that's how we have to do yeah, it, really. Basically. Yeah, basically. Exactly we have to go. I, I fainted this morning to be in the company of these other people. And Everyone's I don't. So much better than me. I don't deserve it. Mm. That's why I need to tell you about it almost. I, I'm announcing, I'm giving it back. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been nominated. You've been shortlisted. Mm. Longlisted. They don't usually announce it. So I've got to go through all the emotional rigmarole of a shortlist and then, you know. Well, we're behind you. Can, is it a panel vote? Or a um, public vote. Panel vote. It's a panel vote. Yeah. Oh, I think panel votes are so much better because public votes are now just who's got the most followers. Mm. I don't do public vote ones anymore because I'm just like, otherwise you have to be on, I don't really like going on Twitter and going, can you vote for me please? And yeah. then I think if you don't do that, then it looks like you've lost when you wouldn't have lost if you just asked your Twitter followers but you didn't want to do that because you're a woman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a terrible paradox. So panel is best. I yeah. think the panel is best. All right, so... Dangerous Women on Screen. Yes. How are you feeling about that, Nat? You are a writer, an actor, and a director. Tell us just a little bit about your film credentials in the context of this. Oh, no, my weak point. Oh, sorry, yes. Shit. No, yes, no, it's Praise fine. No. yourself publicly. Praise myself. Oh, God. Um, so, what did I do? Like, a bit about 2014, I wrote and acted in uh, Starred. Be confident, Nat, be confident. In a short film that was nominated for a BAFTA. Ooh. And then... Best uh, makeup. No, it was best short film. <laughs> it was best short film. Best, best short, short film. film. Best short That's film. That's what it was. And then since then, I've made three other short films, and now I'm moving into making features. And I've got four feature films, like all sort of nudging at the bit for like money, if you have any. 
<laughs> we will be doing a collection at the end. Thanks, Pat. And what's the budget of the film? Just to be. Okay. What's the budget of one film? What, the cheapest the... one? 350. Okay. Uh, 350,000. Not right, 350 okay. pounds. 350,000 mm. divided by, just so that we can get 420. Sure. Some people have put more in and some less. Sure. Sure, sure. That's 833 pounds each. <laughs> so, listen, some of us, if we really dug deep, could do that. Others of us would obviously bankrupt ourselves and be found later in the week. Uh, I dedicate yeah, the not... film to you. Okay, what you will get, apparently, I assumed you would have a stake in the film and get profits, but according to Nat, you will get a dedication. Because um, film production isn't what it used to be. Uh, I was already imagining myself with a large cigar nut. <laughs> Do you think women who direct films are seen as more dangerous propositions than male directors? Oh, God, yes, yeah. I, I mean, God, if you see how few actually, like, get let through and then all you're allowed is, like, one... Not even a mistake, but, like, a film that doesn't do very well and people are like, oh, shut those floodgates. Well, I think it's even harder to... Ugh. For a woman just to get her first feature, seems it seems magnificently hard. I've seen some men with a short that... I mean, it was all right. It didn't really have much of a story. But they did one short. It didn't win anything. It didn't get nominated for anything. It certainly wasn't BAFTA nominated, Nat. Cool. <laughs> And then they get given money for a feature. And you've done how many shorts now? Four. Four. Uh, not as a director, but I've... Uh, yeah, but, like, I've been, you know, integral yeah. to all of them. Integral to yeah, four yeah, shorts. Yeah. yeah. And so it's sort of time, really, now for someone to dangerously give you a pot of money to make a feature. Yeah. I think it's time to pull on your brave trousers and give me some money. Mm. Yeah. The numbers of women in film, it's just extraordinary. Now, did anybody hear about the TROP Festival in Australia... They had a short film fest and there was films submitted by female filmmakers and male filmmakers and one in 16 of the finalists were female and they wanted to up that. So do you know what they did? Free no, lipstick was a, with no, every submission. No, 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 it was a good really idea. bad like No, that. it was a good idea. It was a really good idea. Oh. oh, yeah. No, no, no. Loads of women were entering. They just weren't getting picked. Blind submission. Yes. Yes. So they, like that so thing the, with orchestras. So the judges didn't know if they were female or male. They did it like The Voice. Um, and the judges you can guess a bit now, with the voice the judges <laughs> the judges just had to sit and watch the film I mean it must have been difficult for them blind to the knowledge of who had made this they must have been sitting there thinking well I don't know what to think of it how can I possibly know what to think of it I don't know who made it I is it know. bold or is it naif <laughs> I, I don't know <gasps> is this funny or is this fatuous I don't know and uh, they were so confused that that year it went up to 50-50 Mm. Yep. Because unconscious bias is a thing. It really mm. is a thing. So, Nat, you've made some films with some dangerous female leads and women who are sort of doing stuff. And mm. uh, I don't know, what I'm going to suggest is you make films about women who leave the house. <laughs> Which is very brave of me because it is much cheaper just to film a film inside your own house. Yeah. <laughs> But women who also don't kill the plot. My observation about women in film and television, my, this is my own personal Bechdel test. Hit me. Okay, this is the DF Dubs test. Does the woman try to kill the plot? If you listen to the woman, would there be no story? Because what I see a lot is women on screen going, don't go, you'll put yourself in danger. Don't cook meth in a van. Oh, sure, it's really entertaining, but... yeah. The and that's effect. why, yes, exactly. And that's why women are hated in long running television shows. And the way that that hate for the character is expressed is by Lester's threatening violence to the actress who plays the character. Listen, of course, there's got to be conflict. And sometimes one character wants to do something and the other one doesn't want them to do it. But I see a massive trend for women as story killers rather mm. than story initiators. And the women try and put the story out like it's a fire. Basically, their role is to come in with a fire hydrant, get a bit of it out, but then, oh, my God, it's hit some petrol poured by the man. Yeah. And, oh, now there's more story. There's story everywhere. Oh, my God. Entertainment happens despite her best efforts. Yes. Yeah. This, this is true in every sitcom. Like, look at the mum mm. in uh, Everyone Loves Raymond. Look at the mum in... Look at the mum in every sitcom ever. Okay, <laughs> think of an exception. I'll tell you an exception. Malcolm in the Middle. Oh, I Although love Malcolm in the Middle. Yes. she's such a fun killer that she actually creates story by killing fun. She's an extreme example of the fun killer. 
but she's so good at killing fun. She kills fun in such an amusing fashion. <laughs> she's so mean when she kills it. She's not just a sort of an annoying low-pitched nag, which is what most women get to be in sitcoms. In a way, she ends up being funnier by fun killing mm. than he can ever be by fun starting. But it still follows the same pattern. Um, Marge Simpson, as wonderful a character as she is, yeah. she does kill Homie's fun quite a lot. Yeah. And the trouble is, a lot of the time, like especially as you get older, when that fun killing character starts, a little bit of you is like, well, it's a good point. <laughs> That's true. You hit an age you do, where you go, you do. no, the children should not be allowed to have a petting zoo inside the living room. She's right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to see this plot. That's because this sad plot day is... you watch Mrs Doubtfire and you're like, well, I'm, I'm entirely on her side. Yes, it's you true. You very recklessly. Yeah. yeah, when you suddenly become Sally Fields. We should call that moment in life the fielding, yeah. where you suddenly go, shit, I'm Sally Fields. I want, I want what she wants. Yeah. Please welcome to the stage, Deborah Francis White! What I'm interested in is why men are so much more likable than women when they're unlikable. It's like men can be awful, but there's still something about them where we go, oh, but he's charming, oh, but he's charismatic. He's got a likable quality to him. And I think ultimately it's that we expect more from women. Like if you hear somebody's been killed and it's a man, you go, oh, that's awful. But that sounds about right. <laughs> like if, I, if, a, if a man is the killer, I mean, I should make that clear. I'll say that again. <laughs> if you hear a man has killed someone, you say that's awful. But yeah, that tracks with what we know. <laughs> If you are a woman has killed someone, you're like, why? How? How could this evil demon exist in the world? I mean, if it was a man, but even if a woman helps a man do something bad, we hate her more. We're like, how could you? How could you hold the bag while he killed five people in a row? <laughs> you watched the door, you minded the car, you paid for the parking. It's you, really. And she goes to jail and people seriously hate her more. I think it's because women versus men, what we are really is the good sibling. You know, when your parents go, well, I mean, it'd be one thing if this is your brother, but I expect better from you. That's all women. And I've been thinking about where this comes from. And I think a lot of it comes from the screen. So I was thinking about um, Trumbo. Uh, he was a writer, a screenwriter, who fought... McCarthy's right-wing censorship in 1950s Hollywood. And he types in the bath, it's eccentric, and he shouts at his daughter when she asks him if he will come and watch her blow out the candles on her cake. And that's because we need to see that this great man is flawed and troubled. And so whenever he shouts at somebody or is absolutely vile to somebody, it's almost a hallmark of his genius so he's troubled, but he stands up to fascism with screenplays. That's who Trumbo is. Winston Churchill, did you see Darkest Hour? I mean, quite famously, I probably don't need to fill you in on this one. He's, <laughs> he's fighting Hitler. <laughs> and he screams at his secretary violently for not double spacing a letter. So he's flawed and he's troubled, but he defeats fascism with great speeches. <laughs> Hannibal Lecter. Um, <laughs> murderer and cannibal who helps Jodie Foster catch another terrifying male psycho killer who has an innocent woman in a well assist with homicide with a nice Chianti that's what he does so all of those men are somehow held up as these giants in a way that we should aspire to be they're giants from history and it's almost like a feature that although he is this important giant who shifts things in history look at him scream in a woman's face because otherwise he'd be too nice do you know what I mean? It'd be like, he can't defeat Hitler and be nice to women. That's too much. <laughs> then he's not a three-dimensional character. They actually only bring a woman into the room so he can be vile to her and make her cry and run away. And then we go, oh, there was another side to him. 
I mean, also apart from the incredible racism and colonialism, but we can't get into that because Bishop K. Ali's not here and she'd never forgive me. And there's a scene where Lily James comes in and she plays his secretary and she's new and the other secretary's left in tears, so she says, oh, you've got to do certain things. And then he screams at her so much she runs out crying and she runs into Churchill's wife and she goes, oh, it's what he's like don't worry, I'll have a word. And then his wife goes in and goes, stop being so horrible to your secretary. And he goes, I'm fighting a war. I've got to defeat Hitler today. I can't do that and be nice to girls. (laughs) That's genuinely the story. And I'm fascinated by it because I just think if that's a woman, it's basically the devil wears Prada. Nobody likes her. She's not the hero of that story. The hero of that story is the younger woman who is pretty and malleable and tries hard and isn't mean to anybody because you can't have Meryl Streep and the Devil Wears Prada be the hero of the story but you can have Churchill be the hero of Darkest Hour and that's just a double standard and that seeps into places that are more important where women are on screen like, for example, elections for President of the United States of America (laughs) Because people went on all the time about how unlikable Hillary was. And Hillary herself says, I have a problem with likability. She tells origin stories of why she's so unlikable. She says, oh, but you don't realise how awful it was in the 1960s where, you know, men shouted at me because they thought I was taking their space because if I took their space, they'd then get drafted to Vietnam. And men would say to her, you taking a space here means I might die. And so she says, but that's why I'm so unlikable. And she actually sort of says it out loud. She goes, I understand I'm a cold bitch, but I don't mean to be. It's masking hurt. And she actually has to say it out loud. And I just think about that and I go, yeah, I understand, we all collectively understand that Hillary isn't the warmest. Although Trump is the worst in every possible way and everything about him is nauseating and repulsive and we can't understand how anybody could have voted for him ever. I mean, I wouldn't have voted for him if it was who wins that dirty sandwich box under the table. I wouldn't have wanted him to have that. How people vote. He was the most unlikable narcissistic sociopath in the world. But people still say, yeah, but Hillary was unlikable. And we all sort of know what that means collectively. We do understand that Hillary is a bit unlikable. But why don't we like her? They don't mean political things. They don't mean emails and Benghazi when they say that. It's just a sort of sense that she's a bit cold and she's not that... If she were a man, she'd be so likable. She's not likable for a woman. But she's a really likable guy. If Hillary comes onto the stage and she smiles and she moves around the room and she shakes hands and she makes eye contact and people are like, yeah, but she's not actually giving birth to a kitten, is she? (laughs) And then suckling it live to show her nurturing skills. No, because she wants to be the president. She doesn't want to be your favourite aunt. That's not the fucking gig. And if she did do that, you'd be like, oh, she's a bit of a soft touch. No, we need a president. But whenever a woman walks into rooms, she walks into rooms in a statesperson-like way, and people go, hmm, I'm not really sure I like that. And there's a whole thing about, oh, she wears a pantsuit, she wears a pantsuit. What's every fucking male president worn ever? <laughs> That's all they wear is pantsuits. That's their only option, no. I don't understand. But she wore a pantsuit, and it sort of became like a parody thing to the extent that there's a group called Pantsuit Nation where people went oh I love the pantsuit it's like it's literally the only costume men ever wear she's doing all the boy things really well and more likably than any boy's ever done them I said oh her emails her emails her emails Uh, Yes, she fucked up with an email thing, but then we got to read all the emails and we saw what was in them. And it was mostly asking her staff to print things out because she doesn't like technology. (laughs) And then some like, could we do anything to help this girl who's written to me from Iraq? And then one with alternative campaign slogans. And she should have had an alternative campaign slogan. Her campaign slogan was awful. The campaign slogan that took off, does anyone remember it? I'm with her. And that is awful because it puts the onus on the electorate to include her. And it should have been, she's with us. Because ultimately, if we all have to say, but I like her, a man wouldn't be, we wouldn't be asked to like a man. It would be assumed we liked a man. I really, really feel that the campaign slogan was the biggest fuck up. And I mean, the reason she lost was obviously widespread corruption and the fact that Russia fixed it. (laughs) And even then she won the popular vote. (laughs) They didn't fix it that well, to be honest. But what I'm saying is, is men 
are flawed or even horrible, and there's still something likable about them. You still watch Anthony Hopkins' performance in Silence of the Lambs, and you go, yeah, there's something a bit compelling about him, even though he eats people. (laughs) What I'm saying to you is... What I'm saying to you is... is if Katie Hopkins were a man, you'd like her a little bit. Thank you very much. (laughs) Hello, Guilty Feminists. This is Deborah Francis White from The Guilty Feminist, interrupting a podcast, listening briefly to tell you that I did Mock the Week this week. If you're British, you know what that is, and you can find it on BBC iPlayer. If you're Australian, I believe it's coming to you this week or next. I am very excited to announce Guilty Feminist Necklaces. These are made by Steve Alley and his company Road from Damascus. Steve is a Syrian refugee and half the proceeds go to his continuing education as his degree was interrupted when the Syrian war broke out. And the other half goes to help his mother's project that helps women who are refugees get a craft. The necklaces read Guilty Feminist. They're beautiful, beautiful crafted silver. And there's another that says Woman in Arabic. You can find those at road-from-damascus.co.uk and you can order them no matter where you are in the world. This week, we're talking about films, and I'm excited to let you know that my film, Say My Name, that I wrote and have a cameo in that was produced by a woman and has a powerful woman at the heart, and much like the screwball comedies we reference in this week's episode, is called Say My Name. It has got into the Cardiff International Film Festival, the Liverpool Film Festival, and has won at the London Independent Film Awards Best Feature Film, Best Actor and Best Actress. If you would like to see it at a cinema near you, let distributors know by hashtagging Say My Name Movie and letting us know where you are. People keep asking where my late night satirical uh, show is next week's news. The idea is if we don't like this week's news, let's change it for next week's news. If you'd like to see it at Channel 4 and say hashtag next week's news, when are we going to see it? Felicity Ward is on tour. And I know that you will all want to go and see her because she is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, You can find out the dates at felicityward.com. She starts in Derby on October the 3rd and she ends up in London on December 22nd. And she'll be touring all around the UK. So go and check that out right now and book some tickets. Her show was nominated for the Edinburgh Comedy Award and it is truly amazing. I have a message for you from the Refugee Women's Centre in Dunkirk. Dear Guilty Feminist listeners, the Refugee Women's Centre would like to say a massive thank you for the outpouring of love and support that we have received. When we woke to the news of the warehouse burning down, we were mentally preparing for the worst time. Instead, we have been overwhelmed by the incredible response from Help Refugees, other fantastic NGOs and the amazingly kind general public. The rally of support meant we could continue our services to our wonderful women and children as normal. So thank you. What will make the biggest difference now is volunteers. Like all the refugee charities working in northern France, we are in desperate need of long-term volunteers to help us through the winter months, as well as any specialists who are happy to give their time for a few days. For example, yoga teachers, self-defence teachers, or English as foreign language teachers. We would love to have you. We have already had some amazing Guilty Feminist listeners join our team, so we would love for more of you to come and bring more light and love to the Women's Centre and the people we support in love and solidarity, the Women's Refugee Centre. So if you would like to volunteer or send clothes, donations, money, please go to helprefugees.org and let them know what you can do for the Women and Children's Centre in Dunkirk. And finally, we are discussing two films in this current podcast. The short film that Nat Lutzima and Yasmin Akram made, if you go to the show notes, you can just download it. You can see it for yourself. It's about 15 minutes long and it's called War Paint. And also there in the show notes, you can see the montage that Tom Zielinski made that started our episode today to really get into the mood. I must warn you that War Paint has a scene of sexual assault. This is a content warning. I must also warn you that later in this episode, we discuss the French feature film Elle, and that film contains rape, and we discuss that. 
So that's a content warning for anybody who needs one. Thank you very much. And back to the podcast. Please welcome to the stage... Our wonderful guest for this evening, she is an actor, writer, comedian who you may have seen on Sherlock or as part of the double act, Ford and Akram, or on our very own Global Pillage. She also recently made a wonderful short film with Natlet Seema. Please welcome to the stage the wonderful Yasmin Akram! Hello, how are you? I'm good. When you said my name, I went, like I'd won a competition. (laughs) That's me. You, yes, it is you. You've entered the competition, much like Nat, brilliant. and you've won. I'm very excited. I think we should show your film. Oh, brilliant. And then we should have the conversation around that. Okay. So we are now going to have a screening of War Paint. If you're listening at home, you can't watch this now, but you will be able to in a few months after it's done the film festivals. Or check out the film festival near you and see if it's in there. Or perhaps ask the film festival coming to your town if they would screen it. Yeah. That, do that one. Yeah, do that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's called War Paint, and it was written by Yasmin Akram, who's here. It was directed by Nat Seema, who's here. And it was starring Yasmin Akram, who's here. Two. And if you're listening at home, there is a content warning uh, for scenes of sexual violence. All right. Roll yeah. the VT. I think it's a really interesting film and it's certainly dangerous women on screen the thing that stands out to me is how unapologetically really unlikable that she is from the beginning or frightening that she is from the beginning or unsettling and I feel it's a metaphor for how the patriarchy gaslights women So if you're listening at home and you haven't seen it, it's about a young woman. It starts off, she's going to different groups. It could be a sort of support group or a book group. And she's painting a life of herself. So she's beautifully made up. She's very perfectly groomed. And she's telling stories that clearly aren't really true. And one of the stories she's telling that we see is not the case is that her flatmate fancies her. Now, why do men always fall in love with me? And her flatmate's totally ignoring her. He's not at all interested in her. And she's making sort of flirtatious advances that are being knocked back. But the story she's telling is, he's so in love with me. And then one night when he comes home and comes into her room drunk and wants to have sex with her, she doesn't want it then. She doesn't want it like that. She wants him to be romantically interested in her. Mm -hmm. When she resists, he tries to rape her. She deliberately kills him, basically. Yeah, I mean, she's angry at that point, isn't she? Yes, yes. I don't think she's in fear for her life at that point, but I think she's just had fucking enough. enough. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting what you say as well, because when he comes into the room, the reason that she is so afraid of him coming in is because she isn't made up. When she is made up, that's when she's looking for attention because she feels good. But she's got so much self-hatred that mm. to see her in her granny nightdress... Yeah, and no it was very important. On. It's a very unsexy nighty. Like, yes. There's this whole allure of, of sexual, like, um, oh, sophistication and alluringness, but, like, n- no. Yeah, like, when it's not on her terms as well, like, it just feels... She, she doesn't understand why he likes her in that... Or why he's even trying to have sex with her in that moment yes. because she's not in the fairy tale of herself. And I think we talked about this an awful lot, but I think one of the most dangerous things that movie and and television... Movie, just one. um, She's only seen one, don't tell her. (laughs) Don't tell her there's more. I think they're all the same, though. Um, (laughs) Movies and television have done to women is that they give us this idea that if we just look right, we'll be loved. Mm, And it's said over and over again, how many movies have we watched where a woman changes a man's life? That's what we're there to do. You know, we give them erections, we change their lives. That's our jobs. (laughs) And so she is very much this person who believes that. She believes that she has the dress and she's got her face on. Her prince is going to come. Mm. And so she's that, playing by the rules. Exactly. She is totally playing by the rules. Mm. And so it's very upsetting to her. That's just the point where she goes, I've had enough. Like she's, it's not like she's 22 as well. She's had a lifetime of these kinds of interactions where she's trying to be, as we say, the demure 
perfect, smiley mm. woman, and then it just never works out for her no. because she needs therapy. Mm. Just not groups, actual therapy. Mm-hmm. Yes, you can see the promise of her response if this was to be a feature film, which may it be a feature film? Yes, w- it is. We've only bloody finished it. Have you finished the feature film? Well, oh, no, she's written the script. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, that's what I call finished. Yeah, again, does not dabble in the filmmaking process. No, no, no. Uh, no, okay. no, no. <laughs> the promise of the feature is that the lead character and a sidekick she's kind of corralled in mm-hmm. might become revenge killers. Well, or... funny enough, that was the initial idea, wasn't yes. it? And the script has dog-legged off a little, but I, in a really well, don't, interesting... Well, don't tell us, because we now would definitely yeah, see okay. that feature. Yeah, okay. yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we were talking about those, when you reverse it, it isn't the same. So we're talking about, like, my best friend's wedding. Yes. So Julia Roberts' best friend, who for a long time has been in love with her, is now marrying someone else, and she's decided, oh, no, no now I realise I'm in love with him, mm-hmm. and pers- goes to the wedding to break it up and to stop it and get this man to fall in love with her again. Yeah. And we were talking about how interesting it is because she's morally reprehensible throughout. But if that were the man, it would be romantic. Of course, yes. At the end of the film, she doesn't manage to win back the love of Dermot Mulroney. Yeah. Or Who th- is so bland. The so most bland, bland man in the entire world. Well, he's the woman in that. Well, he's yes, the he, woman. Yeah, yeah, she's exactly. the interesting one. So he's the, just the sort of fill in your love interest here. And she goes to get him back she doesn't get him back and he says no and he marries the one he wants to marry which is yeah. a very young Cameron Diaz yeah. so yeah, you know, yeah fair of enough. course yeah it's very difficult to compete That's with the a nightmare, very young, isn't it? yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, who wants to compete with a very young Cameron Diaz thank god that day has passed because she's, <laughs> she's not very young anymore I mean Phew. No, I mean now we obviously we can all sleep at night <laughs> watching it I remember thinking if this were a film about a man mm. At the end of the film, he would come out outside the wedding with a boombox. And he, of course she would come to him. Of course. Yeah. Of course. He'd be the no... male Julia Roberts. I can't even imagine what that is. That's, oh, that's yeah, charming young, as shit is what that is. That's young Clooney. That's what that young, is. I was just going to say, exactly. Yeah. It's young Clooney. As imagine a romantic comedy with the young George Clooney where he doesn't get the girl. <laughs> I wouldn't even watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that one movie and it was George Clooney getting the girl. And I never want to see another one. No, no. See that's the one you saw. And you were talking about Elle. Was mm. Elle an inspiration for this film in any way? We watched yeah, it. we went to go see it together. Yeah. Um, me and Yaz were the only people in that cinema. And uh, so we were behaving quite badly. And all the way through, at various times, one of us would go to the other, it's very French. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so Elle is a French film. It's so a French. A woman, yes, super is, French. a woman who is sexually assaulted yes. and does it by a masked man and then she's trying to work out, she knows it's someone in her world, mm-hmm. she's trying to work out who it is and she she's doesn't there. go to the police. No. Slightly disappointingly, she's given a, I mean, God, this is spoilers, but again, it's a couple Sorry. of years old, so I, you do you. You should have watched yes. it. Yes, yeah, there you go. Pause Fingers in your ears. If you want to watch Elle, pause yes. now, watch Elle and come back to the She's given this backstory where she doesn't go to the police because her dad was a serial killer and so she doesn't trust the police and all the rest of it. And actually, I do think it would be a bit more interesting if she simply did not go to the police. Yeah. She's mm. Isabel fucking up her and she's yeah. not going to go to the police. Mm. And she's like the head of a video games company so she's in a very tech bro kind of world and she's just... But yeah, she just makes very idiosyncratic decisions where you're like, oh, oh, I didn't see that coming. Yeah. And she's banging her best friend's husband. Yeah, we. I mean, there was times during it where we were looking at each other going, I hate this. This is a fucking stupid film. I hate it. <laughs> and then about an hour afterwards we went... I love that film. Oh my God, it's so great. Yeah. French films are the opposite of Chinese food. <laughs> you feel oh, full an hour theory. later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You say, yeah. oh, no, that was good. Yeah. No, I get it now. Yeah. Just, it's just... Yeah, because the ending, she wanders off with her best mate, like hand in hand, pally as you like, even though she knows Isabel mm. Upper has been, you know, boffing her husband. Yeah, and so so but she starts so playing strange. power games with the men yeah, in the yeah, world yeah. and sort of hitting on one of the ones that she thinks she starts was, sleeping with the guy she thinks raped her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As a power so moved back, on. she knows it's not really about sex; that rape is about violence and power and yeah. domination. And so she starts to fuck with men in her world mm-hmm. to try and dominate back and win this. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. That she sees it as a game of violent chess And there's something and quite liberating. Win. It's almost like the worst has happened now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, it kind of, I mean, what, you know, is she going to get raped again? Well, well, you know. Well, it opens with that, doesn't it? That's the, the first scene That's is it, the rape. Yeah, so you're mm-hmm. just kind of, and it's very graphic and shocking. Um, but it, I, it's weird when you watch something and afterwards you're amazed by it, but when you're watching it and because... It's not a typical movie because every single turn you're going, she's doing, she's doing that. It felt so unnerving and so unsettling, even though afterwards I really appreciated that it had been made and that it was so wonderful and, and she's so wonderful in it. But 
because you don't see women on screen behaving in that way, even as somebody who wants to make films like that, I didn't like it in the moment that I saw mm. it mm. because it was so well, it, it just, was so new. Yeah, it's yeah. a distance from our expectation. As I was saying before about we expect more from women and we yes. don't like... I think we need to see more uh, callous women and fewer nurturing women on screen mm. yeah. to adjust really to the idea... To that yeah. not all women are feely touchy all the time. Sometimes women are ruthless. Sometimes women are reckless. Mm. We see that in our life. Mm. Yeah. But then we sort of hate more the female senior manager who does something to close a deal or... Not that we want to encourage people to be ruthless and reckless of yeah. any gender, mm-hmm. but there is a, a disconnect that we hold, and I think storytelling is a lot of it. Coldness is very interesting. I think a cold female character mm. uh, is one of the hardest types of female character for an audience to really have empathy with, and Isabel Upper is cold. And the woman in... Like, she doesn't even have a name in Warpaint. She is just the woman. Always, yeah. And she is cold. And there was definitely a feeling every now and again when we were making it, like, oh, should we just... Should we warm put her up? Yeah, yeah, throw were in just one little to? scene. So, yeah, from time to time, because you don't want everyone to hate her. And I think in the feature, she's more fully rounded and you can kind of... I, I think it's in the feature, women start off and when you watch it, you go, ooh, that's not like me. But I think halfway through, you go, the feature. Sorry, this yeah. is pointless to say it because you haven't read it. But I've I read it because no, no, I wrote it's it. A, no, it's, 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 we've got a final draft uh, document. It's <laughs> yeah, it's we'll pass around the draft. Yeah. But I think in the future, about half an hour when you start going, oh, I fucking done that. Yeah. And I think that that's the thing. It's like, she seems very distant to us when you're watching Just it. Just to be clear, Yasmin. Mm-hmm. No, nobody's... No. <laughs> no, no, no. If no, you're watching films about women murdered. cutting up men and then putting them in a boot, I and you're do, thinking, I've, I've done, done that. that. We've all, we've all we, been there. It, that requires a wider conversation. When you have a spear after afternoon mm-hmm. in Dublin. Do you know what's really interesting, actually? Even in the edit, there were constant decisions to be made about warming her up and or keeping her chilly. And the toilet scene in particular, when she's talking to Pima through the door and mm. she's comforting her. So there's a version of that scene where the music is different. It's not that eerie, sliding, weird, like mm. unsettling music. And the shots are closer up on your face. Oof. And you're being kind of, oh, no it's an absolute that. nightmare for the listeners. She's a wreck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you're closer up on her face and it's kindness but then if we use more shots that are set further back and you're further away we don't have much empathy with your character mm-hmm. and you have that sliding music and now she's not comforting Pima she's manipulating her and it's so interesting there's definitely a version of this film where like she has warmer sides yes yeah but that's not really as interesting is it no and I think also as well as that when women watch it they can or anybody can watch it and relate to yeah. yeah men can watch it it's fine We'll allow your eyes it's to the It's about screen. women, though, so will men enjoy it in any way? No, no, they won't. Cause Listen, <laughs> no. men it's... don't know what's going on with women at all. No. And when they see them on screen, they freak out. That's why we put the boobs in. Yeah. <laughs> Jens was like, shall I bring them? Shall I leave them at home? I was like, I was get, get the like, boobs out as yeah, much as we can. Excellent we'll lose decision the decision to, um, to put the breasts into yeah. the film. Because I think that's the at least something. The feature is something. just my breasts. We... <laughs> <laughs> producer at one point I hope you don't mind me telling the story yes but it's gonna happen oh, well. um, the producer is my boyfriend and he said at one point he was like I'm not sure about some costume decisions like she's put her in some very revealing dresses and I said do you admit, that's Yasmin's own dress thank you very Remember much for her uh, birthday party I she am is. single <laughs> and I go out in dresses that are too tight for me they are not too tight they're showcasing every every curve they're doing a lovely flaunt <laughs> but like just the thought that Dermot was like oh you know shoving that shy little flower into a tight dress <laughs> you know, but, better. but actually that sort of sexualizing of women as well a sexually powerful woman on screen I was thinking about the graduate mm-hmm. I mean mm-hmm. she's highly sexual she's in charge of her own sexuality and she's doing something extremely morally dubious or even just morally open shut wrong yeah. Yeah. I mean that film was made in the 60s but I actually wonder if that film would be made now Oh, yeah. In some ways, we are becoming a little bit more conservative, I think. I we? think so, because you, yeah. like, look, you look at the... In, in films, you look at the screwball comedies of the 40s and the 50s, and it's all sort of Catherine Hepburn walking around going, I don't listen to you, I don't take that from you or any man. I'll never take it from you, I'll never take it from you now, and I won't take it from you later. Well, I might take it from you later, but only on my terms. <laughs> <laughs> I want that back. Yeah, that would be amazing. I desperately want that back. These wise cracking, yes, yeah, yeah. Dame May West, and you know that—that's the thing. Oh. That we don't see 
I mean, the, you know, this conversation could go on and on, but we never see women getting to be the funniest person on screen. But they it's, really were the in the script as well, like yeah, bad yeah. and They naughty. really, really were. Do you know something that's interesting? I found out that my great, great aunt, when I found my biological family, because I didn't know anything about my biological history, I desperately always wanted to come to London and always wanted to perform and no one else in my family was a performer. And then I found out that my great grandmother was in London and in vaudeville. <gasps> wow. Um, and she had a double act with her sister. And when they split up, my great grandmother became a ballet dancer. I did not get that gene. <laughs> but her sister, my great great aunt, became a comedian. And you can see it on all the bills. It sort of says Lucy Coventry, comedian. You know, she's here, she's here. And they do a census every four years. And she's always in different theatrical digs with different theatrical people. And every single year, every four years, she says she's 23. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't even 23 the first time she said it. <laughs> now, I'm a feminist, but that's my age. And uh, so I was like, oh, wow, we have so much in common. We're both 23 forever. Forevermore, um, yeah. Because we, um, I'm not used to doing stand-up in spectacles. They're very new and they're very, very big. And so I can see all of you incredibly well. Um, but I definitely feel like it's given me a lot of faith in my own intelligence that I never had before. <laughs> Even though I've got a slightly Ronnie Corbettish sort of nudge the way I push them up. But anyway, spectacles on. Um, like most noted academics and intellectuals, spectacles, I'm on a constant quest for self-discovery, thoughts about the self, the soul, morality. But I've pretty much cracked it because I think that if you really want to see your own soul, if you really want to see who you are, look at what you Google when you're drunk. <laughs> That's you. That's you in all your unvarnished glory. No one looking. I honestly, the morning after a drinking binge, let's call it a binge, um, I honestly look at my search history with nerves as if I'm about to discover something about myself that I'm really not going to like. As if one day I'm going to find some really violent, nasty, like, porn or something on there. And I never do. It's always top load of videos. <laughs> it's not even Dancing in the Moonlight, guys. It's the lesser known ones. Oh, High Flying Bird. Yes, yes! Oh! Get in my veins, you sweet, sweet smack of pop. Um, it's always that. And also, and this might be the most sexist thing I Google, but I do Google it pretty much every time, is that one from Fleet Fox's hair. <laughs> that one from Fleet Fox's. I mean, firstly, I'm not sure if foxes should have an apostrophe in that mangled sentence, but I put them in. And secondly, she's the singer, she's the songwriter. Still don't know her name, I just like her hair which is so shallow of me. And I wake up with loads and loads of Google images of her hair all over the place. So uh, that's what I find out about myself. I'm quite basic. And that's really upsetting, isn't it? I always think that when you are drunk, that is a real insight. Or, or when you're really scared. Or if you get road rage. Like, what you yell at someone is such an insight into your personality. And it's so bad. I always go for badly dressed. Badly dressed, bitch. Like... <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I mean, I suppose I'm glad. I'm glad it's nothing terrible, but also pff, a bit less shallow. Could you be? Could you? A little? No, that's just who I am. I'm so shaky and clammy. I'm at a very difficult age where I think I can drink like I'm in my 20s, but my body says I can't. <laughs> and I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh, I'm seriously ill. Oh, God, please call the police. <laughs> And I'm very, very ill. And I woke up in my boyfriend's parents' house as well. And you'd think I would show some decorum. No, I was like, Carmel, I'm very, very ill. He said, yeah, you drank loads of red wine. And I was like, no, it's more than that. <laughs> you don't understand. You've given birth to four children. You don't understand pain, Carmel. It, well, well, two of them were twins. So actually, you know, it's just a clusterfuck, that, isn't it? Uh, uh. So I'm just sweating pure red. Sorry, sorry, everyone, sorry. I think that is really my biggest flaw. <laughs> my father said the other day, if I have a fault, he said, which is a very contentious beginning to a sentence. <laughs> if I have a fault, he says, I don't think I could decorate a cake. <laughs> Thoughtful pause, and he said, but then I've never tried, so I probably could. <laughs> wow, wow, that self-confidence. 
Where does it come from? Why will it never go? <laughs> He sold something on eBay the other day and uh, he didn't think that the woman who bought it would know how to assemble or deassemble the wardrobe. So he painstakingly disassembled it and then put it back together and filmed himself doing that for her. And I know, I mean, would he have done that if it was a man? Probably. If it was a young man. My father only respects, like, people who are exactly his age. Any older and they're doddering. Any younger, they're fools. <laughs> But the joke's on him, because he was listening to Kiss FM and had some quite sexually aggressive music in the background. So what he'd done was make this woman a very niche music video porn mashup. <laughs> if you like seeing a man squat and go, ah, and fiddle with joinery, while someone sings, lick my back, lick my neck, lick my pussy and my crack. <laughs> well, have I got the video for you? Um, I do think I'm shallow. I think that's it. I think if you've got to look your faults dead in the face, I am a bit shallow. And I must confess, I'll leave you on this. Oh, that's bold. You might just all hate it. And I'd be like, not leaving you on that, am I? Obviously not. Um, when I feel I'm looking old, which train windows are my nemesis, uh, I will go and shoplift a little something. <laughs> it's very little, and it's from a big store, Deborah. Don't look at me like that. I'm not going into boutiques, am I? Unless they're hipster boutiques. <laughs> I mean. Uh, firstly, because I am very good at shoplifting. It, like, you do it for years as a teenager, and then what, you're just meant to let that skill disappear? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. It's who I am. I'm very good at it. It's like mastering pre-drinking, where you're so drunk you don't need to drink anymore, but not so drunk you can't walk through the door of a nightclub. <laughs> like, it, oh, it's, it's finely balanced. Now, I will go shoplifter thing, and that's white privilege as well, isn't it? Because, like, I do know I'm just, when I've got my little blazer on and my specs on, that no security guard is like, turn out your pockets, please. But if he did, oh, <laughs> the stuff that's in there. Um, so I'm terribly shallow and I'm very good at bigging myself up. Um, I've been Nat Let's See You've been lovely. Goodbye. <laughs> Great, so war paint. What did you think of war paint? Did you enjoy it? Yeah. Um, would you like to see it as a feature? Yeah. Um, okay, so please, where do they tweet about it and say they'd like it to be a feature? Oh, oh on the I, internet? I, I think just to the internet in general. <laughs> there's, there's no, no one, one person. There's no per one person we're sort of concentrating Creative our England efforts on. or, you know, mm, BFI or... I don't think... Uh, you're looking at me and I... I, I okay, I, hashtag yeah. seen war one paint. Film. So if you just hashtag guilty feminist hashtag war paint yeah. and then you can find anything hashtagged yes. and then send it to someone with money. <gasps> That's yeah. so good. Oh, and if you didn't like it, keep that to yourself. Shh. <laughs> To keep track of everything we're doing, go to Twitter, Instagram, and please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast and give it five stars. Do you have anything else quickly you need to plug? Anything you need to tell us about? Oh, Short story? Oh, i got a new book out. It's called Lou Out of Luck. It's um, bright pink, and it's for teenage girls, but deep down at heart, we're all teenage girls, so go just grab some copies. Hey. Lou Out of Luck. Amazing. Uh, I've just finished a TV show called The Reluctant Landlord. It's not on for a while, so chill out and then watch it when it's on. <laughs> the Reluctant Landlord, great. You could follow me at, at Nat Lertzema. It's good content. <laughs> Excellent content. Super. It is good um, content. And could you... And if you... <laughs> if you tweet about this show, if you could hashtag Guilty Feminist Film Club and suggest other films with dangerous women that you love in uh, that you would like to see perhaps here at the BFI, and you can at BFI. Uh, my Twitter is at DebraFW. We also are at Guilt Film Pod. Uh, so please copy us into that and uh, we will see you very soon a big round of applause for everyone at the BFI <laughs> for Tom Selinski who made that lovely montage <laughs> the wonderful Yasmin Akram <laughs> and the excellent Natalie Seema <laughs> I've been Deborah Francis White thanks so much good night You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Nat Lutzema, and our very special guest, Yasmin Akram. The recording engineer was Grundy Lazimbra. Music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Selinsky for The Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Tony and Hannah at People Joe Live and everyone at the BFI, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. We've got two things. These, we've got the dubs. I mean, I can't really call it the dubs test because that sounds a lot like dubstep. Alf. 
Oh, I was thinking of Lord Alfred Dubbs and the, the, um, the Dubbs <laughs> Agreement. We're that, very different people, Deborah. That's so interesting. <laughs> I was thinking about I was thinking about the the policy of allowing refugees safe passage as uh, refugee refugee minors safe passage. Uh, and the protection of children in international waters. And yeah. you were thinking of... Dub- <laughs> right. 